All right, hi, and thanks for joining our stream today for Earth Day. My name is Alyssa Shear, and I'm the Programming Director at March for Science New York City. And I'm happy to be joined today by Emily Fano uh, for an interview on her work leading an effort um, for important climate education legislation in New York State. Um, so for a bit about Emily, she is the Senior Manager of Climate Resiliency Education at the National Wildlife Foundation in New York. And as I said, she's been leading this effort to pass a bill that will update state education standards across grade levels um, to include more lessons on climate change. So Emily, uh, let's get started. From what I know over the years, there have been several attempts to bring more climate change education into New York classrooms. Um, yet in a recent survey done by the task force, you're a part of the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, um, they found that there was still a lot of room for improvement. So could you tell us about um, those results and also how those results help lead to this bill and the movement that you're pushing for right now? Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me uh, as part of the March for Science Earth Day celebration. Um, I first wanted to just mention that the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force was founded in 2018 by the National Wildlife Federation, and it's an intergenerational community of um, educators, students, NGOs, community members who are dedicated to expanding access to climate education in our state. And we are currently co-managed with We Act for Environmental Justice. And so you mentioned that our task force uh, launched the first actually uh, pretty comprehensive climate education survey for New York City teachers in 2021 in partnership with the teachers union. And we got over 1500 responses um, from a pretty broad spectrum of teachers. So a good representative sample. And back then, what, what the survey told us is that 52% of teachers actually said they teach about climate change, but they do so um, for only about one to two hours per school year. And that represents the national average, um, sadly. And uh, close to 90% felt that that wasn't enough time. And so 68% of teachers in the survey said they actually don't have time to teach about it. Um, 73% of teachers uh, said that they felt climate change would harm future generations. And yet over 90% said they'd never attended a teacher professional development workshop um, on climate education, even though a majority said that they would like to. And more alarmingly, 80% said they had never had any climate training in their pre-service courses. So when they're learning to become teachers, which means when they go into the classroom, they're not climate ready. And as the New York Times, uh, a New York Times article recently showed, a majority of teachers are saying that they don't feel prepared to teach about it. So um, in fact, 59% of teachers who answered this question about a mandate in our survey said that they would feel more comfortable teaching about it if they knew it was required. Um, and of course, now it's really not. And so we know from this survey that the desire um, to teach about climate change is there. Um, and we certainly know students want it. Um, but teachers need support from their administrators. They need uh, more time. And above all, they need the training to feel comfortable. Yeah, definitely. We don't want to throw things at teachers that we're not preparing them for. But um, all that preparation definitely uh, is better if there's support from the state for, for that preparation. Um, so um, how would you say the current state education standards um, cover climate change? Do, do they do enough? Or um, do you think there, ne there needs to be improvement there? Well, uh, so, you know, we, we refer sometimes to the next generation science standards as new, but in reality, they were officially adopted in New York in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, they won't be tested at the high school level until June of 2025. So, um, you know, our state standards are a modified version of next generation science standards, which were actually published in 2013. And they were uh, built on upon a framework that was actually published in 2011. So they may be new to high schoolers in New York, but they're not really new. And so we also know that um, we're pretty sure that none of the non-science disciplines include the phrase climate change. Um, there are, of course, ample opportunities to include climate um, for example, the Industrial Revolution was the start of, you know, humans burning fossil fuels and so on, and that could be included in social studies. Uh, but the reality is that because the standards are not explicit and they don't use the words climate change, 
um, teachers, especially teachers who don't have the training to teach about this topic, don't understand where they can fit it in. And so, um, you know, we also have some uh, issues across the state where in some parts of the state, in the more conservative parts, teachers um, are actually being told that they're not allowed to say climate change. They're not allowed to use the words in school because it's considered too political um, or, you know, the, it's considered indoctrination when, you know, we know that majority of scientists, um, you know, believe that uh, this is important information for the public to have. And certainly our students should be prepared to understand what's happening. Um, most of them have lived through some kind of climate disaster, whether it's, you know, orange skies and unbreathable air or flooding that's closed their schools. So they're living through it, um, but they're not learning about it. And these, these events are not even being used as teachable moments by teachers because the teachers don't feel equipped to talk about it. Um, they, they're really not sure how to talk to their, to their students about it. And so they just don't. Yeah, and it certainly doesn't help if school administration or others are, you know, kind of putting a chilling effect on what words and language can even be used um, to talk about those, those topics. Um, but um, from what I know, New York would not be the first state to implement these kind of curricular changes. Um, I think it's New Jersey has uh, climate education in their standards. So could you tell us a little bit about maybe how other states have navigated some of these issues and how um, New York could do the same? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, several states actually have um, endorsed the teaching of climate education. And in fact, New Jersey is the first state in the country to have mandated that in 2020 through a Board of Education resolution. Um, their education structure is a lot simpler than ours. It's under the governor's purview. So decisions can be made much more quickly. And so uh, New Jersey did uh, mandate climate education across all grades and content areas back in 2020. And then California, um, followed suit in uh, October 2023 with Governor Newsom signing a bill um, to support climate education in the state's public schools, um, and that requires students in grades one through six and seven through 12 to emphasize the causes of climate change and methods to mitigate and adapt to its effects. Um, in September 2023, Maine launched a climate education professional development pilot um, grant program that encourages local education providers to partner with community organizations to provide professional development to teachers. Um, in July, 2023, Connecticut schools required by law to teach climate change as part of the science curriculum in grades five through 12. Um, and then the, I think one of the first programs in Washington state's climb time program, um, which is primarily focused on climate science um, with uh, funding from the governor's office um, and a very strong teacher training component, um, you know, basically started it all. Um, but, you know, we are playing catch up to New Jersey and other states that are um, preparing their students for this. And um, as a purported climate leader, um, New York should not be, you know, lagging behind other states in um, preparing its students. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, New York needs to catch up, but it is promising to know that other states are having success with those kind of programs and hopefully hopefully we'll be right there with them soon. So with that, um, you mentioned earlier that um, part of what this bill is asking for is not just climate education in the science classroom, but um, across disciplines. Um, and so I wanted you to give you a moment to speak on why you think that's so important. Um, like you were mentioning, talking about the industrial revolution and a history class. Um, and if you could maybe give us another example of how um, climate education could look in maybe an English class or even a physical education class and how that might be different from the science classroom. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, as we know, um, the climate crisis is impacting all sectors of society, right? We know that um, from 1980 until 2023, um, the climate crisis caused over two point, I think, six trillion dollars in damages. So it's impacting our economy. It's impacting businesses. It's impacting agriculture. Um, you know, there's uh, weather extremes that are making it hard to grow food. Frankly, there's droughts in the Midwest and the South. There's extreme floods. There's 
strange weather happening. And that is of course going to impact all kinds of things. Um, it's already impacting education because um, millions of students around the world are not able to go to school because of climate disasters. Um, you know, schools are often destroyed or it's too hot to learn. And that's something that, you know, New York City students have certainly um, experienced. And so um, we're, we do a pretty poor job of teaching systems thinking in schools right now. But from a you know, physical perspective, um, systems thinking is really about how climate effects can impact multiple systems. And so, you know, we know that the consequence of warming can lead to other things such as, you know, the melting of the polar ice caps, as you see behind me, um, you know, impacting, you know, salinity and ocean currents, and that in, in turn can disrupt weather systems and rainfall patterns and, um, you know, the way that uh, animals migrate. Um, so, you know, impacting biodiversity, um, food security, um, exports, so the economy, as we said, businesses, livelihoods, trade, um, migration, you know, um, people are already migrating to um, from one place to another because of climate disruptions. And so it's, you know, geopolitics, it's social, it's economics. And so once uh, people start to see the interconnections between all of these systems, um, you know, it leads to critical thinking. And that's one thing that we're not really good at, you know, teaching kids about is how to think critically in our current education system. But we need students to be able to think critically, uh, you know, and to be flexible thinkers and collaborative, uh, work collaboratively to solve problems, you know, because the climate crisis is, is a mammoth problem that is going to require a lot of critical thinking and, um, you know, <laughs> thinking of solutions that are, you know, span many different, um, you know, strategies. So I think systems thinking helps develop critical thinking. And that's that's really the most important point here. Totally agree on that. Um, yeah, it's not, not just affecting what scientists do in the lab, but it's affecting all aspects of life. Um, and so another um, thing that this bill could help with is also, um, you know, if students are more informed, especially in the systems thinking way, it could actually help them to turn any anxiety that they're feeling about the climate, about climate change into more meaningful action, because they'll know more than just, you know, I can do an experiment to prove that climate change is happening, but now I'm taking the systems based approach to understand many angles that um, mitigation and resiliency can uh, come from. So could you explain a little bit about how you hope the bill could help students um, with that climate change and change anxiety uh, that they might be feeling? Sure, yeah, we know uh, that students of all ages are experiencing climate anxiety, not only from research studies, there was a big global study that uh, was done, I think a year or two ago that showed that, you know, students, um, you know, within a certain age range, um, you know, up to young adults were feeling very um, bleak about the future and were deciding even not to have children, which is, you know, very sad to hear. And we've heard that from our students that are um, participants in our youth steering committee. So the task force has a youth arm and we know, you know, from their own testimonials that they are feeling very anxious about the future. And so, we know that knowledge is power. And um, once you have information, you feel a little bit better about um, things that seem uncertain. And we also know that action is the antidote to anxiety. And so by first educating students about the climate crisis, we're certainly helping them to understand what's happening around them. Why is the sky orange? You know, why are there so many wildfires? Why are, you know, are these weather extremes happening more often? Um, and then once you know what's happening, you can find meaningful ways to take action, whether that's taking part in a march, uh, March for Science, or uh, writing to your elected representatives, or implementing a local climate solution in your community. So um, it starts with information and education, and um, that's always helpful in quelling anxiety. Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. Our motto, motto at March for Science is actually educate to empower, which speaks to all those uh, points you just mentioned. Um, so great. Um, and so our last question before we wrap up is hopefully people listening are on board with this um, you know, systems-based climate education that we could bring to our schools. Um, so if people viewing want to get more involved or want to find a way to sub help support efforts to promote this bill, um, what, what, what do you suggest that they, they could do? 
Yeah, we invite anyone who wants to support our task force's efforts to visit our website at CRETF.org. Um, we have a policy page where you can uh, write a memo of support um, to as either as an individual or an organization to help support our uh, bill, um, S278A uh, and A1559A. Um, you can also become a member. Um, we have events um, and uh, workshops and we um, welcome students to join our youth steering committee. That's um, a cohort of high school students that meets weekly starting in September. Um, and uh, But we welcome folks anytime. We're an intergenerational movement that is essentially building um, support for climate education across the state and we need everyone. So we welcome everyone's involvement. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that it's intergenerational and you have the youth being a part of it. So. I think that's a great thing to add in maybe for any uh, science educators or other educators uh, watching that, you know, you could promote this effort to your students and maybe they would want to help join the task force um, in the, the youth part of it. Um, okay, great. Um, that's all I had for you today, Emily. Um, I think this is super informative. So I hope everybody watching um, is feeling inspired about bringing more climate education to New York. Um, but even though we can feel inspired about that, we have to do work and, and push for it. Um, so hopefully joining those efforts um, is something that you can plug into as an Earth Day promise um, so that we can get education improved for our students and they can know how they can make meaningful change um, in this climate crisis. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. All right. Have a great day.